Hi, my name is Suresh Singh. I am one of the mentors at Programming Patshala. I am expert on code forces and five star on code share. Hi everyone. Today we are going to solve a problem named dice combinations from CSCS problem set from DP section, right? So let's see what problem statement says. So problem statement says that we will be given with a number n, and we have to find out the number of ways in which we can get a sum equals to n by throwing a dice one or multiple number of times, right? So if we throw a dice, then what can be the possible outcomes? We can get one, we can get two, we can get three, four, five, or six. These are the only possible outcomes. Now we have to find out the number of ways in which we can get a sum equals to n by throwing the dice one or multiple number of times, right? So they have also given an example. So let's see that. So we are given with n is equals to three, and they have also given the possible outcomes one, one, one. So in the first throw, we can uh, get one. In the second throw we can get one, and in third throw also we can get one, and this adds up to three, right? Similarly, the second possibility can be that in the first throw we can get one, in the second throw we can get two, and this also adds up to three. Third possibility can be that in the first throw we can get one, uh, sorry two, in the second throw we can get one, and this adds up to three. And the last possibility is that in the first throw itself we can get three, right? So these are the four possible. Ways to get sum equals to three by throwing a dice one or multiple number of times, right? So here we can see one thing that uh, this one, two, and two, one are permutations of each other, but we have to count them as two different ways, right? So we will be focusing on distinct permutations. We will be counting them different, right? Now, if problem statement is clear, then we can move on and try to find a solution for this thing. So let's take three as an example. We want to find out the number of ways in which we can get a sum equals to three. So for that, we can throw a dice, and if we will throw the dice, then these are the six possible outcomes. So if we will throw the dice, then we can get one as a possible outcome. And we wanted three as a sum. We got one, so the remaining value will be two. Second possibility is that we can get two. We wanted a sum of three, but we got two, so the remaining value will be one. Third possibility is that we can get three. We wanted three as a sum. We got three, so the remaining value will be zero. Now the fourth possibility is that we can get four from the dice, right? But if we just look at this possibility, then we can say that it will be of no use. Why? Because we want a sum of three, but we already got four, right? So this way can never give us a sum equals to three. So we can skip four, five, and six for this example, right? Now let's focus on these three possibilities. Right. So if we will get one from the first row, then the remaining value will be two. Now what we want to calculate here? Here we want to calculate the number of ways in which we can get sum equals to two. And why we want to do that? Let us just see. So there are two different ways in which we can get a sum equals to two. And those ways are one, one, or two. In first row we can get one. In the second row we can get one. And this adds up to two. Or we can get two from the first row, and this also adds up to two. So we have two different ways in which we can get sum of two, right? Now what we can do is we can just simply add one in both the ways. Now the sum of these three values is three, and sum of these two values is also three, right? So calculating number of ways to get sum equals to two can help us calculate the number of ways to get sum equals to three, right? Similarly, here we want to calculate the number of ways in which we can get a sum equals to one, and here we want to calculate the number of ways in which we can get sum equals to Zero, right? So let us just try to do that. So for sum is equal to two, we can again throw the dice, and again we have possibility that we can get one. If we will get one, then the remaining value will be one, and the other possibility is that we can get two from the dice, right? And in that case, the remaining value will be zero. For this, we have one possibility, and that is that if we will get one, then the remaining value will be zero. And all the other possibilities are of no use for this because all the other possibilities will be having a value greater than one, right? And this is already zero. So similarly, we can say that there is one possibility, and we will get zero, right? If we will get one from the dice, all right. Now, can we observe one thing? Can we say that all the root to leaf paths are representing one of the ways to get sum equals to three? We can say that, right? Let us just see this path. So this path represents that on the first throw we got one, on the second throw we got one, on the third throw we got one, and this is a way to get sum equals to three. Now if we just look at this path, in the first row we got one, in the second row we got two, 
and this is also one of the ways to get sum equals to 3. This is one of the paths in which from the first row we got 2, from the second row we got 1. So this is also one of the ways to get sum equals to 3. Similarly, this is also one of the ways. Right? From here can we observe two things. First one that we have multiple options. Second one, all those possibilities have same problem definition. For example, here what we want to calculate? We wanted to calculate the number of ways in which we can get sum equals to 3. Here what we wanted to calculate? We wanted to calculate the number of ways in which we can get sum equals to 2. So the problem definition is same, only the size is reducing. right? And because of these two possibilities, we can think of a recursive solution for this problem. So let's try to find out a recursive relation for this problem first. So we want to implement a function which can give us the number of ways that can sum up to n right? by throwing a dice one or multiple times. So let's take n is equal to 3 for now. So we want to calculate f of 3 which is nothing but the number of ways to get sum equals to 3. So we have already seen the first possibility is that we can get 1 by throwing a dice and if we will get 1 then we want to know the number of ways in which we can get sum equals to 2. So because this function is finding out the number of ways in which we can get sum equals to n, so we can call this function for f of 2, right? Similarly, the other possibility is that we can get 2. If we will get 2, then we want to find out f of 1. And if we will get 3, then we want to find out f of 0, right? So now we can say that number of ways to get sum equals to 2 are 2. We have already seen, right? There are two ways to get sum equals to 2. There is one way to get sum equals to 1. And there is one way to get sum equals to 0 and that is to not throw the dice, right? So now can we find out the number of ways to get a sum equals to 3? See, if we will get 1 from the first row, then the number of ways are 2. If we will get 2 from the first row, then the number of ways is 1. If we will get 3 from the first row, then the number of ways are 1. So we can say the total number of ways to get sum equals to 3 are 4. Right. So if we try to generalize this recursive relation, then we can say that f of n will be equals to f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2 and so on till f of n minus 6 because we have 6 possibilities from 1 to 6. And this recursive relation will be valid for all the values of n greater than or equals to 1. Right? If n is equals to equals to 0, in that case we can say the number of ways are 1. And if n is negative, in that case, we can say the number of ways are 0. We can never make a sum which is negative. Right? Now let's try to write code for this recursive relation. We want a function, let's say solve. We will be passing a value n and this function should return an integer value. So the return type should be int. Right? So first we will take care of base cases. So if n equals to, equals to 0, in that case we should return 1. If n is smaller than 0, in that case we should we should return 0, right? And if these two conditions are not true, that means n is greater than or equal to 1, in that case we want to follow this recursive relation, right? And for that what we can do is we can simply run a loop from 1 till 6 and we can call all these functions and add their values, right? So let's have a variable initialized with 0. Now we can run a loop from i is equal to 1 to 6 and what we can do is we can call this function f of n minus i. So it will call all these functions and we want to add their values. So what we can do? Answer plus equals to. Okay. So after this for loop we will be having the answer in this variable ans. So we can return this and this will be the recursive code for this relation. Now if we just look at this recursive code it is having an exponential time complexity, right? First, the first node will make six recursive calls. Then all those six recursive calls will make six more recursive calls. So it will go exponential, right? So we can try to reduce the time complexity. So let's just see how we can do that. This is the recursive tree for f of four, right? Now, if we just look at this recursive tree, we can say a lot of function calls are same. They are made again and again. For example, f of two, f of two, right? f of one, f of 1, f of 1, f of 1, right? So same calls are made again and again. So we can say we have overlapping subproblems. And because we have overlapping subproblems, we can calculate their answers, we can store them and reuse them instead of calculating again and again. If we look at this recursive function, we can say that there is one variable which is changing. And this variable can have values from 0 to n, right? 
So to memoize this recursive function, we can use an array or a vector of size n plus one, right? And we will have to initialize this array or a vector with some value. So what can be that value? We can initialize it with minus one because we can never have minus one base to get a sum, right? So we can have a check if we have already calculated our answer, then we will simply return. So if dp of n is not equals to minus one, that means we have calculated the answer for given value of n. In that case, we can return dp of n. And if we have not calculated the answer for n, then we will first calculate and we will store it before returning. So dp of n is equals to answer. So we are storing it before returning from the function. So now if we talk about the time complexity of this thing, then all these if, if checks are order of one, right? And this takes order of six time, right? And this part will be executed how many times? At most n number of times, right? So we can say that the overall time complexity of this function will be six into n. And space complexity will be big O of n, right? So time complexity and space complexity. If you found the video helpful, then do like, share and subscribe. And if you are looking to improve your problems on skills and get 100% interview ready, then take a free trial on ProvineParchana.com. Link will be in the description.